Welcome to Justice Matters. I'm San Francisco Public Defender Jeff Adachi. Technology, of course, has changed our lives, but it has also changed the way that police and citizens interact. Citizens are taping police officers, and now the police are taping their interactions with citizens through the use of body cameras. Many police forces have started using body cameras to record events. This can help provide an objective record and avoids the controversy that often arises when police say one thing and citizens and witnesses say something else happened. But will cameras make our communities safer? And does this new technology used by law enforcement violate our constitutional right to privacy? In a room full of officers, some in uniform, sits one man who hung up his uniform decades ago. When I retired as police chief in 1996, I did not know what email was. Now a professor at the University of San Francisco, former SFPD Chief Tony Ribera is hosting this symposium to help bring the latest technology to a notoriously skeptical bunch. They're to some extent skeptical about the body cameras, but I think on the whole everybody looks forward to going to work with a body camera on every day. Atherton police were early adopters of body cameras as video plays a vital role in more and more cases. Put your hand behind you. Anybody with eyes can see what happened. It can incriminate or vindicate Somebody will say, complain about my actions, and I'm able to use the, the video to go show that I did everything perfectly. The latest cameras can play back right in the squad car. Review it in the field, uh, show a supervisor, write a report without ever having to go back to the office. That's no ordinary computer. Beyond taking a beating, it uses other cameras to continuously scan the road for stolen cars. The cameras, the software is all working uh, in the background as they perform their jobs. For all the new technology that's being made especially for cops, the next frontier might actually have a more familiar face. The most important tool on a police officer's belt is quickly becoming the smartphone. San Mateo police can hear radios and view dispatch on their phones. A critical incident came up. I was able to get it on my smartphone and listen into the digital radio uh, sitting there in Washington, D.C. with my family. That would not have been possible even, you know, about three months ago. But Chief Susan Manheimer is more excited about using phones to solve crimes. Look at a pill identifier to identify what kind of controlled substance it is. Do biometrics to look at absolutely who the individual is if they're giving you a false name. There's an app for everything like finding all the social media posts from the time and place a crime occurred. It's all impressive to Tony Rivera. They have the district station right in their hand, all the information they could possibly need. With us on Justice Matters to help answer these questions are Richmond Police Chief Chris Magnus, Independent Police Auditor of San Jose and former Judge LaDoris Cordell, and Ellie Winston, who is an investigative reporter. Let me start with you, uh, Chief. You're police department was one of the first uh, to begin using uh, body cameras on all of your patrol officers. Can you tell us, has it worked? Well, we've been certainly looking at it for the past year and studying it and trying to develop policy that will be appropriate for the department and the community and also exploring the different technologies that are involved. But I think I guess the jury's out, so to speak, on exactly whether it works or not and how well it works. Our officers like the idea of having some documentation of their enforcement activities out in the field and they feel it gives them a measure of protection from bogus or false complaints. And I think the public by and large likes the level of accountability that comes with having those kind of encounters recorded. Um, will it stifle some of the communication between police and community and other uh, and other interactions, I guess that remains to be seen, but uh, so far so good. How large is your police force? So we have about 190 sworn officers, but at any given time a much smaller group of those folks are actually out on patrol doing enforcement related activities. And so it's the, it's the men and women that are out on patrol that would be wearing the cameras. But it could also include detectives who are executing a search warrant or even school resource officers going about their business on a day-to-day -day way. So it, it depends, but it's not every sworn officer in the department because that would include a lot of people who are not necessarily dealing with the public. Now, Judge, your job is to ensure that police do their job and that they're accountable. 
and you've been an advocate for uh, body cameras. Do you think that uh, they will ultimately result in a reduction of officer-involved shootings and that police misconduct uh, will be prevented? Well, um, body-worn cameras are coming to law enforcement. Um, of the 17,000 police departments throughout the country, eventually they're all going to have cameras. And to those, you know, departments that are resistant to them, uh, they need to get over it because cameras are coming. Uh, are they the magic pill? No. Uh, will they combat, help officers combat crime? Yes. And will they hold officers and members of the public accountable for their actions? Absolutely yes. So it, it's really important that leadership, such as the chief in Richmond, embrace this technology and understand that it's very, very important to move forward. Uh, there, there, there are issues that are going to come up with these cameras. The technology is rapidly changing. There are a lot of questions that you've raised in your introduction to this program that are going to have to be answered and will be answered in hopefully the short term. Uh, so it's important. I've been advocating in San Jose that cameras come. The police chief is supportive of this. Uh, hopefully now the uh, police union is in favor of it. I know the public wants these cameras. So uh, it's coming and uh, it's going to be a big help to the police and to members of the public. Now, Ali, you've written a, a lot about uh, technology and civil liberties. Are you concerned that these cameras are going to impact uh, citizens' uh, rights uh, when it comes to, you know, not having a videotape of somebody's arrest or interaction with police on TMZ or the evening news. There's always questions about data security when you have this amount of collection going on, this amount of audiovisual information being gathered by sworn officers in the course of their day-to-day -day duties, which sometimes are not pretty, as we well know. But Right now, the most important thing for law enforcement agencies is, is to ensure that they have policies that tightly govern how these cameras are used when they're turned on and off, if they are cameras that, are, that officers can turn on or off manually, and how the data is stored, who has access to it, how long it's kept, how, long, how it's uh, accessed in terms of uh, court cases for evidence for prosecution or for the defense, as it would be in your office's case. Um, in the short term, in this country, the civil liberties concerns mostly have to do with releasing information about people who haven't been charged or who may be minors or may be protected under different state laws. For example, laws in Washington state are much more looser in terms of whose information can get released. Every single video that's gathered by law enforcement in Washington state is considered public. In California, it's not like that. So there's going to be a period where laws are going to have to catch up with the technology. In the future, however, there is the possibility that these uh, cameras, that these devices could be matched up with other sorts of technology, with biometric technology such as facial recognition, as it's done, as is done in the United Kingdom, where law enforcement have cameras that are capable of taking still pictures of individuals in the field. They can then transmit those images back to headquarters or back to a station, and that image is then archived in a biometric database of mugshots. And in the United Kingdom, there are about 16 million people whose images are archived in a national database, regardless of whether they've been charged, convicted, mm. cleared of a crime. So that situation is not happening in the US, but the technology exists for that possibility to come to fruition. So that wow. is something that people should keep an eye on. Now, uh, Chief, in terms of when the cameras are activated, when you have your officers wearing the body cameras, are they always on? And what sort of policies uh, do you have that govern, you know, how these devices are operating? In other words, is, is it up to the police officer to decide what to record and when to record it? Or do you have uh, some other way of, of setting policy for that? Well, we do have um, expectations that are laid out in our policy about when the camera should be activated. And they are manually activated by the officer. Um, so clearly for um, encounters with public that involve um, enforcement activity, investigative stops, traffic stops, things along those lines all would be mandated for recording. Where we wanted to really draw the line, however, was, I mean, we have our officers involved in a lot of um, neighborhood engagement. They're talking to folks out on their beat. Part of, a big part of their job is proactive um, relationship building with residents. and. 
we didn't want to sort of stifle that by every time an officer's having a conversation with somebody in a neighborhood about maybe a concern they have mm -hmm. about something that's going on or um, an issue that perhaps they wouldn't even want their neighbors to know that they're talking to the police about. Um, we didn't want those kind of conversations to be recorded. It's one thing to be, mm -hmm. you know, recording on a DUI stop or to be going into a domestic violence incident and documenting what's happening there or when an officer stops and has some investigative contact with somebody. But a lot of our interactions are just positive, casual, consensual <laughs> contacts with, with residents and other folks that are out and about. And I'd be concerned if we were, you know, recording all of those. And the feedback we got from the community is that they didn't want those things recorded. But Jeff, you know, if I could jump in, yeah. I have a couple of concerns about, one about officers having the discretion to turn on and off the cameras. Um, there was recently an incident in Menlo Park where there was a fatal shooting. There were three officers, all of whom were supposed to be wearing cameras and activating them. One didn't have his camera, said it was in the repair shop. Another said the battery was low, and the other just didn't turn it on. Um, so th there are real concerns about, and, and about officers turning on these. I'm not saying they deliberately don't turn them on, but in the heat of the moment, they indeed may forget because these are new. Uh, there's new technology where uh, cameras are automatically activated. For example, when an officer gets out of the patrol car or when sirens are activated or even they're attuned to the speed. If they're speeding mm -hmm. to a scene, they, they automatically come on so the officers don't have to manually do it and it lends, lends more credibility to the, the use of the cameras. Second, uh, about these procedures, you know, you say they're written and I think that's wonderful. The key, I think, for the trust of the community is that these protocols or procedures should be made public. I don't know if yours are. They should be posted online. Everyone everywhere should know exactly what those procedures are that guide the police officers. And finally, there have to be immediate consequences for officers who violate the protocols. So the officer who didn't get the camera turned on, was in the repair shop, there should be consequences, and I'm talking about discipline, to make sure that these cameras and the use of them is taken very seriously. It was pointed out in a number of high-profile uh, incidents around the country that uh, the officers actually did have body cameras but didn't have them on a at the time of the crucial incident. And it also raises the, the question of, you know, who has access to the footage, right? There's all this video that's going to exist. If you have every officer uh, who's r recording transactions, um, you know, eight, ten hours a day, uh, where is this information going to be uh, archived? Uh, who's going to have access to it? It's going to be some kind of giant cloud. Uh, and, uh, you know, is there going to be control uh, over uh, the, the judges and prosecutors and defense attorneys who need this information in court to make sure that it has integrity? Uh, any thoughts on that? So, depending on, in the, again, this goes down to state law and department policy. Uh, in California, there's no statewide policy on how long video is retained for and who has access to it. Some police departments, like the Oakland Police Department, which has had these cameras since 2011, um, the video is stored in-house on in-house servers that are owned by the department and the department releases video on a case-by-case -case basis. For example, during the Occupy demonstrations in 2011 and 2012, many officers were wearing lapel-mounted cameras and the department made a decision to publish a lot of that video online. Um, other officers, as in, in, at other points in those demonstrations, officers did and did not turn on their cameras at crucial moments. They were disciplined for that. So there are examples where that sort of those sort of repercussions have come out. What, um, what happened to them? What kind of discipline? Training, slight suspensions, but in some cases those officers were then promoted to positions of importance in the department. I mean, it all goes down to the department's internal workings and those are procedures that reporters and the public don't have access to, unfortunately. But in other departments, like the Los Angeles Police Department, Chief Beck, um, Chief Charlie Beck recently stated that they're, ado they're adopting video cameras, lapel-mounted bo uh, body cameras. He said that there will be no access to, for the public to these cameras. They will be released as the department wants and in court mm -hmm. procedures only, but they will try and close off the court procedures to not have the video shown mm -hmm. or have it shown in camera. So there's a, there's a lot of ambiguity and a broad variance in terms of who has access to this video and where. Um, each company that sell, each different company that markets these, uh, these cameras and the storage units 
markets the storage differently. Some, like Taser, have a back-end uh, cloud, uh, cloud storage service called evidence.com that uses a rack space, that uses server space uh, from Amazon Web Services to store that video in a cloud. So it's a third-party private company that stores criminal evidence. And it's not just video, it's also um, PDFs, images, locational data. There's a lot of information that can be put into this cloud, which speaks to a broader question about what is happening, what technology is doing to the chain of custody for criminal evidence, how that works out in terms of the discovery process, how it works out in terms of retaining evidence for you know, possible um, you know, post-conviction uh, post review. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a brave new world. I mean, mm -hmm. this is all stuff that's coming right, down all, this year. The com these new. companies, the Taser cameras and their uh, their evidence package that's behind the cameras, is literally just going on the market this year. And it's very early in the process. It's hard to see how this is playing out. I, I, I do think though that we need to bring some reality back to the way that these cameras are being used by police officers. This is new technology, so I think it, it, any of us can look at technology that we've had to become accustomed to in our day-to-day -day lives, ranging from our desktop computers to our smartphones, and recognize the challenges of doing that, and we're not even under pressure most of the time to figure it out. So to say that um, you know, there ought to be automatic discipline and, uh, you know, harsh consequences right off the bat or that there's some insidious motivation if an officer isn't uh, remembering to turn their camera on 100% of the time with brand new technology like this, I think is, isn't right or fair. We've, uh, you know, our officers are in the learning curve. I think actually they have, by and large, been very supportive of using the cameras and see it as a way to protect themselves and to back up the decisions that they're making. But at the same time, I, I gotta be real about it. I can't imagine as somebody who, you know, worked in the field many years ago trying to keep up with the technology that cops have to deal with now it's gone well beyond having a radio on your belt that you have to turn on. The amount of uh, things that they have to attend to at a moment's notice, I think we're going to have to figure out how we work together to build training. Cops need to train with cameras. That should be part of their police academy experience, so they're using them from day one. They should be incorporated into firearms training, use of force training, um, performing under pressure. But I think, you know, most departments in the Bay Area are new to this, and as they adapt, the idea that there's something deliberately calculated to not turn them on, especially under pressure, I, I think is a little unfair. There's another issue, too, that comes up with the, the chief in L.A. saying that uh, none of the video will be made available. Um, and it's a right of access to what if you're the subject of? You're a civilian, but you're in the video, and you want that video. So you have that, and then you have the Public Records Act. So how much of this is right. should be available through the Public Records Act? So these, again, are all cutting-edge yeah. kinds of issues that have yet to be worked out. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, who can get access to, to your video now? If, yeah. if, if the person who's the subject of the arrest wants to look at the video, can they? Um, yes, because it would be, we look at it similar to, you know, if you're the subject of an arrest, you have a right in preparing your defense to get the report and other documents related to that arrest. This would be evidence just like the police report would be. So that's appropriate under those circumstances. We, but I, I totally agree with the judge that this is, uh, you know, it's all over the map about how this is being handled in different places. And there's no clear guidance to police departments departments even about what should be done. You talk to DAs and folks and they all will give you a little different take on what needs to be held, what can be released. You know, our view is that just like we, we we're, our plan is to handle this kind of evidence like we would other evidence. If it's something that a defendant would have access to in terms of a report, then the video would also be right. If it's an open investigation that we wouldn't normally release to the media or the public other than a summary of what's happened and, you know, some specifics in terms of names of folks and that kind of thing. We're taking the same approach with the video. But if it's not an investigation or if it's closed as an investigation, then I can't frankly see what grounds we would have not to release this. Right. Let me ask you, Judge Cordell, the reality is that if you have these body cameras and you have video, uh, that you're going to have a record of, of what happened, hopefully. But 
at the same time, we've seen cases, for example, Eric Gardner, who was uh, basically chokehold. It wasn't a, a police video. It was a civilian taking a video. He was chokehold. And, uh, you know, you can see, I don't know, eight or nine officers basically jump on uh, him. He's saying, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. You have all of this on video, and still there are no charges uh, brought against any of the officers. So when people say that body cameras mean accountability, is that really true? Because if officers aren't going to, for the most part, be held accountable anyway, what does it matter? Well, there are two things that that apply to this. One is the grand jury, criminal grand jury process that declined to indict. That's a whole other issue. Um, I, my view is, and I've said this publicly, I think criminal grand juries should be abolished. But that being said, with cameras, the cameras or camera that depicted and recorded the Garner killing um, was by an onlooker from one position away from the officers. Had these officers had cameras and had they been recording, the various positions of the officers and their, what they saw would have been captured by the cameras. So, and that could be very and likely very different from that captured from a distance. So I think it's comparing apples and oranges to say, well, the video didn't result in, in an indictment. That, that's, that, that is not an appropriate assessment. If there had been cameras, there would have been cameras up close and personal showing exactly what these officers were doing. So I don't think that the fact that there was not an indictment should be an indictment of body cameras. I think body cameras would have been absolutely critical in depicting what happened there. In fact, we have a, a study that was done of the Rialto uh, Police Department in California. It was a one-year study. And it showed that it resulted in a substantial reduction in the number of complaints uh, by police and also uh, use of excessive force. Right. And, and I don't want people to think Rialto is some sort of an anomaly. It is not. Rialto is a, a city in California, 100,000 people. They have 100, at least when the study was done for a year, 115 officers, 70 of whom were outfitted with body cameras so that there was a control group, officers who did not have them. And, and Rialto, from 20, 2009 to 2011, had six or seven um, homicides per year, which was 50 percent over the national average, if you given the size of the community. So this wasn't some small, little, isolated rural community. And so that citizen complaints dropped almost 90 percent, and also use of force dropped about 60 percent. That is highly significant, and people should take notice of that. It's not an anomaly. It's what indeed can happen if these cameras are utilized in the proper fashion. The chief who, Chief Farrar, who's the one who did this, was very progressive thinking uh, and really got out in front and determined that this was something that he needed to test out, and as a result, we should all take notice, and that's absolutely another compelling reason why Every police department should have these cameras. In, in, in Richmond, have you experienced uh, similar drops in complaints of excessive force or, you know, officer-involved uh, shootings or abuse? I think it's too early for us. I mean, we've yeah. just implemented the cameras, but we we see that. I agree with uh, with the judge, and uh, we've seen similar results in other communities that have had these for longer periods of time. Mesa, Arizona is uh, another good example of a city that's mm -hmm. had significant drops. And I mean, it, look, the simple fact is we all behave better on camera. Um, I don't know that has maybe scary implications beyond policing, but you um, want to be like the Truman Show. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't think we want to go that far. But I do yeah. think that you know this uh, it, it probably improves the conduct not only of the officers frankly, but of the public that's dealing with them as well. And if we can all be more civil in our engagements with each other, I'm not sure that's such a bad thing. Well, there's a lot of other just wild technology that's out there. And there's something that's called the Stingray. And uh, Ali, this is something that you've written about. Can you tell us uh, about these Stingrays, how they work, and what the dangers are? So Stingray is another word for a device that is, it's actually a particular name for a, a model of a device that imitates a cell phone tower and it attracts the signal. It, it, like a cell phone tower, it collects a signal from all devices that are transmitting a cell phone signal in the area and collects metadata, call information. Um, in, with some models, you're actually capable of listening into the call uh, from all cell phones in the area. It's indiscriminate. It's, um, it's, I guess, full take, to use some terms that you would other, that you'd use for other technology that the National Security Agency uses. Um, these 
devices are relatively secretive. Uh, the company, the manufacturer, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation make departments that either buy or loan devices, depending on whether you're buying it from the manufacturer or loaning it from the feds. They make them sign a non-disclosure agreement to not discuss the use of such equipment and without the manufacturer or the federal agency's agreement. Um, those, I've spoken with some legal experts and they opine that that's a direct contradiction of the California Public Records Act. Um, but these devices and other devices such as a different model of um, equipment called a dirt box that's used by a number of state and federal agencies and local police departments a as dirt well. Box. A dirt box. It's a, actually it's a more powerful signal that is uh, uh, that has been capable of taking in cell phone calls and radio transmissions for quite some time and eavesdropping on them. Those devices are, there's a, they're becoming, they're kind of like um, surveillance cameras were a few years ago. They're getting more publicity. People are becoming more aware of them. Law enforcement uses them in, you know, investigations of high-risk suspects involved in violent crimes, homicides, uh, robberies, shootings. But the fear is that these devices, because they don't require a warrant, can be used to track people engaged in lawfully protected activity or constitutionally protected activity. So before we go, I wanted to ask you, uh, Chief Magnus, uh, about your participation in the Black Lives Matter uh, rally. And there was a photo that was taken of you holding a sign. And I understand you were out there for like four hours holding a sign. There's controversy uh, about it. Uh, can you tell us why? Well, I, you know, my command staff and I wanted to um, engage with the community that had showed up for this rally. Um, it was entirely peaceful, nonviolent event. Um, because of our ongoing community policing work in Richmond, we knew most of the folks who were out there, and it was a great opportunity for us to talk to people and see, you know, where can we build bridges and where are the opportunities that lie ahead for better dialogue around these issues. So at one point while I was um, out there talking to uh, a woman of color who had her two daughters with her, uh, we had a great conversation. She asked me if she could take a picture of me with the sign. Looked at the sign, I thought, actually this is something I can fully get behind and that the city of Richmond uh, embraces fully. Black lives do matter. Of course we understand all lives matter, but the point of the rally was to emphasize what has historically been a disconnect between police and communities of color. So it was about trying to send a message that we are serious about bridging that gap. Not an indictment of police across the board or saying that all cops are racist, not an endorsement of riots that have become violent and you know ugly, but rather a commitment for bridge building, better relationships between law enforcement and police, and respect for marginalized communities that we serve. And that was the point behind it. Well, it took a lot of courage uh, for you to do that. And uh, I think that most people uh, stood with you, so. Thank Some, <laughs> not all, but that's okay. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Whatever your feelings are about law enforcement and technology, one thing that's certain is that technology is here to stay. Only time will tell if technology will help cities reduce crime while preventing police misconduct. I want to thank our guests, Chief Magnus, Judge Cordell, and Ellie Winston uh, for being part of our discussion. And we'll see you next time on Justice Matters.